Well, good evening, Grace Point family. We are with you here once again for our midweek Bible study, continuing on in Romans. We're in chapter 9 tonight, and I think, Marcy, we're going to get through all of Romans chapter 9 tonight, as long as you guys don't interrupt us with a lot of questions, which, since you're not really here, I don't think that's going to happen. So we should be good. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Romans chapter 9 is great. We're on the heels of uh, the great stuff that we talked about. The, there are favorite verses from Romans chapter 8. Just amazing stuff in there. And so Paul's going to continue on in Romans chapter 9, and we're looking forward to it. So uh, glad to have you uh, here with us whenever you, whenever it is that you're watching. And uh, we're glad that you're uh, connecting uh, still with us and with our church. Uh, we encourage you to leave comments, prayer requests. Um, just tell us hi, how you doing, and, and we'd love to love to see those comments on there. But I hope you're having a great week, and uh, we'll open up with a word of prayer, and we'll get into it. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for um, the love that you have for us, that you've shown us through Jesus Christ, and that we get to experience now through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father God, would you bless this time together as we study your word, as we um, figure out what you have for us, how we can apply it to our lives. And Father God, we just know that you you do have something for us. Your word is the lamp that we use to light our path. And so, Father, thank you for that. Would you be with the prayer requests that we have uh, of those that are, are, are sick, not feeling well, Father God, of those that are, are still doing battle on the front lines of this virus, uh, those that are, are working in the midst of all this every day, Father God, we just pray that your, your hand would be on this entire situation. God, we know that there are people that are dealing with uh, marriage issues and parenting issues, Father God. Would you, would you bless those uh, families tonight? God, we love you. We praise your name, and we need your hand of, of mercy and blessing on each one of us. So, God, we pray that for our Bloomfield campus as well as our Sheraton campus, and we just we pray for your, your hand to be on us tonight as we open up your word. Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us, and we are just so grateful that we get to come and to learn more about you and that you reveal yourself to us through your word. And, Lord, we just are so grateful that we get to learn more and more about you. And, Lord, we pray for some of this prayer requests that we have here in Sheraton. We, I pray for Patty as she's had this procedure done this morning, um, that you just continue to have your hand on her and continue to have the hand on your hand on the doctors that are helping her and those that are helping her. And, Lord, we just pray that you just continue to have your hand on this whole situation and be with her as she heals from this um, procedure. We pray for Connie still and that she'll just continue to show her how much you love her and how much you're right there with her. Lord, we just pray for the other prayer requests that maybe we are not aware of or that we're not remembering right now, Lord, that you just continue to have your hand and, and work in the lives of the people in both in both um, of our fam church families, the one in Sheraton and in Bloomfield. Lord, we just thank you. We just thank you that we get to be involved with two just wonderful church families, and we just pray that you continue to be with each and every person that's in our church family. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, how's your week going, Marcy? Um, <coughs> it is going all right. I yeah. finished one class, and I'm finishing another class this week. So Good. it's kind of things are starting to wrap up, and we're starting to wrap up with homeschool. So Bet the kids are looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah Got yeah. the pool set up? Yeah. Ooh. I might know what I'm doing tonight. <laughs> it's a little cold tonight. It's, it's a, a little, little cold, cold tonight warm up eventually <laughs> you mean you haven't gotten that thing heated yet adam no oh, okay well just a, a couple of announcements before we get started as most of you know for the bloomfield campus this sunday we're going to be open for public service and so we encourage you to come if you are able to um if you are uh healthy um and and, and not in the at-risk group we encourage you to come and be a part of that we'll have a uh, seating set up that uh in, that enforces social distancing we'll have hand sanitizers there um, we'll have an offering box in the back of the church um, that you can place your your tithes and offerings in there so we don't have to worry about passing things around we won't have any bulletins we won't have a greeting time those kinds of things are, are just to help us make sure that we kind of keep our hands to ourselves and, and those kinds of things even though i know uh, some of us really want to go you know wrap our arms around someone's neck in a good way not in a bad way but in a good way and uh, we're, so we're looking forward to that and want to encourage you in Bloomfield 
to come and be a part of that again if you can. If you're not feeling well, please stay home. If you are um, an at-risk person for any reasons, whether you've got an underlying medical condition or uh, due to your age, um, you feel more safe staying at home, we would encourage you to do that. And continue to watch online. We'll have it available, as we always do, uh, every week online. And then in Sheraton, we just met with the church board tonight. Uh, this is Tuesday night that we're recording this, but we met with the church board, and, and the church board has decided we want to continue to uh, err on the side of caution. Uh, and so uh, we're going to keep um, our campus closed here in Sheraton indefinitely, uh, looking more towards the middle of the summer uh, before we're able to really open up. Uh, there's been a couple of new cases that have popped up in Lucas County. And so we want to do our due diligence and make sure that, that uh, we're doing what we can to keep people safe. Please keep watching online. Please keep praying for each other, reaching out to each other, all those good things. So that's that's the kind of the big announcement about church and how we're operating there. But we'll continue to, to record these things for the midweek Bible study every week for, for a while, uh, in through the summer probably, or middle of summer at least. And uh, we'll, we'll just keep keep informing you of what we've got going on from, from here. But uh, we love you. We're praying for you. And uh, we're just glad that, that you're a part of our church family. Uh, one thing I just, on a personal note, um, I, I have been preaching in front of a camera for nine weeks now. Marcy did her, you know, preached uh, this past week in front of a camera with no audience, right? And and I, what I've learned, and I don't know if you experienced this with the with the one time that you did it, it's so much better with you guys there. Um, it, to to get a, a nod of affirmation or or a, a hearty amen, uh, even if even if you're being sarcastic, because I know that's that happens sometimes. But uh, the the reality is, it's so much better with you guys there. Um, now, while we understand that we have to do what we have to do uh, to stay safe, um, I am so looking forward to being back with you guys. So that's that's all I wanted to say, and just to know that that we love you. We're part of a family together called the church family, the body of Christ, and we need each other. So, uh, anyways, what you got for us tonight, Marcy? So tonight we're going to be going through Romans 9, and we should get through about all of this thing because um, I have some notes on it, obviously, but um, it kind of all kind of flows, and Paul kind of, there's not a whole lot of things that he says that kind of has to be explained. So It's fairly analytical. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. like a, he's getting more into just straight information mm -hmm. at this point, which mm -hmm. is still good for we We definitely need it. We need to understand this stuff. So Yeah. yeah. So, like, in Romans 9, Paul is kind of shifting his argument slightly, um, and he starts speaking directly to the Jews. Now, earlier in Romans, Paul is talking about the righteousness of God, and now he's kind of shifting to the righteousness of God in history, kind of looking back with the Jews. Um, so, I wanted to r read real quick out of um, this N.T. Wright Romans study um, he brings up this story. He talks about like um, reading a map. And as I started reading through this, I kind of remembered this story um, that uh, there was one time Adam and I were in Des Moines. And, you know, I, of course, grew up in Prairie City, so I was fairly familiar with Des Moines. And he put a location in, in GPS and how to get there. And I said, that's not going to get you there. We're going to have to take another path. And he goes, no, the GPS is right. And little did he know, it brought us to a dead-end street. <laughs> and I went, why don't you mm. pay attention to the person that, that grew up around Des Moines? Anyway, so that's kind of where this story um, kind of goes. Um, but he says, uh, we see in Romans 9, what we see in Romans 9 is Paul's going back to the beginning of the map and starting again. Jewish thinks thinkers in his day often retold the story of Israel beginning with Abraham or even with Adam, in order to explain the whole sequence of God's actions and their history up to the present day and even beyond. Paul is doing something similar. Here he tells, from one surprising angle, the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of Ishmael and Esau as well, in order to explain what the map, God's word of promise, has in mind all along. He had misread it and he now believes and is eager to help others who have misread it in the same way he kind of talks about how um the jews you know and we'll talk about this in through here but the jews were kind of going wait a minute we're the chosen people why are the gentiles now getting this opportunity mm -hmm. did god have this wrong did he tell us wrong and paul's saying he didn't have it wrong 
we misread the directions. Wow, that's good. So, good. Um, if we, w- I kind of, I kind of just broke this up into really kind of bite-sized pieces um, tonight. So we'll go through um, just about five or six verses at a time. So would you mind reading verses one through five, please? Sure, I can follow instructions, mm-hmm. unlike other people. <laughs> Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Oh, theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Yep. I thought that little five was a little no. six. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So Paul kind of starts out with the sincerity to the Jews. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. He's saying what I am saying is true. Um, And then another point I wanted to point out there is Paul says he wished he could offer himself up for them. Um, But then, interestingly enough, he doesn't call them brothers and sisters like he normally does, you know, th- he, when he talks about other, he doesn't call them brothers and sisters. And, and and actually, the words he uses there, those of my own race, um, the original words there uses the words, or getting the, the idea of kinship, that this kinship is only skin deep. It's not this, this real deep um family relationship that he normally talks about when he talks about other believers. He's talking about these are my people, but only just because, like, through blood. That's so good. Like, I, like, and I don't know where you, for sure you wanted to go with that, but it just brings to mind the, the idea, like, as Christians, we have more, or we should have more in common with other Christians in Iran or Africa or some other country where our skin is not the same color, where our uh, culture is not the same culture, our history is not the same history, traditions not the same traditions. We have more in common with with people from there than we do with other Americans who are not Christians. And if that's not the case, if that's not true, we're doing something wrong. We should absolutely have more in common with Christians, no matter where they're from, than non-Christians who might happen to be our next-door neighbor. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a very much a family. You know, we are part of this family. Um, and there going on, Paul lists off these God-given privileges to the Jews. Um, adoption, divine glory, covenants, receiving of the law, temple worship, the promises. And he points out the ancestry of the Messiah. Um, and so that's just, he wants to point that out there. That, you know, because they they had rejected Jesus. Well, and it, it reminds me of what you preached on a little bit, that football analogy. Mm-hmm. The Jews definitely started on the 50, if not on the, the scoring side of the 50, right? They mm-hmm. they had it all. And, and I, I put myself in that category when you think about today's world. I, I was in church from day one. Parents who were saved um, raised me to follow Jesus Christ. Uh, didn't have to really want for anything in the world. Like, this... These Jews should have gotten it right, just like I should get it right because of the way that I was raised, what I was born into. It was it's it's, it's an advantage, and it, that's the truth of what it is. And we need to understand that advantage and and not forsake it. That's that's good. Yeah. So why don't we go ahead and read um, verses six through nine? All right, verse six. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated, at the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. That's so good. there's 
And like where Paul's kind of answering that question, where the Jews are trying to understand how the Gentiles are a part of this. And they're kind of asking that question, has God changed the plans? And Paul is directly answering that question. It is not as though God's word has failed. Um, he, God hasn't changed his plans. Um, and he's challenging their thought there in the last part of that. Um, not all who descended from Israel are Israel. Uh, he's saying they're not all cl who claim their patriarch Jacob as their forefather are truly Israelites. Yeah. And then um, he goes on there to kind of state his point. In, in verse 8, um, is not the children of physical descent. Um, ch children of flesh is basically what he's saying. It's not the children of the flesh um, that are ch the children of God. So it's not like a fleshly thing. It's, you know, he'll argue on later in the chapter, you know, it's through faith. Um, children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Um, I, just, I think that's so important for us to understand, like, you know, I was I, I was raised by parents who, uh, who who took me to church, so I'm good. Or my my grandparents took me to church, um, even though I don't have anything to do with church now. Or uh, you know, I, I, I kind of hit and miss on on my participation or my attendance or my tithe or whatever. Uh, if you are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are that fleshly descendant and not the spiritual one the one of the promise mm -hmm. uh we've got to have that relationship with jesus christ you can't depend on your, on your heritage right you can't depend on the fact that you were baptized at mm. yep. you know in infancy and so now you've got this you know it's through faith yep. and paul will talk about that later on that it's through faith and not just who we were born to yep. um and so then uh i guess Unless you have anything else to say, we're going to skip on to, well, chapter or verse 10 through 18. Yep. Good. Uh, not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's promise and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Mm -hmm. That's a terrifying verse. Yeah. So Paul is is starting out there in making his argument um, the, where he talks about the divine word rather than the physical lineage determines the heir of the promises. Um, in, in hi, that's in him saying the older will so serve the younger. Um it's the order of God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. And so he's saying, you know, that it was through that divine word rather than the physical lineage, um, the older will serve the younger. And that wasn't really what typically happened in that day. Um, and it was through what God had said that that happened. And so then there in verse uh, 13, he says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so um, this Jacob, Israel, Esau, you know, is the Edom. And so that, I don't know if you want to, if you have anything to add to that whole um, yeah. part well, it, there. It goes to show, so like, so Jacob being Israel, Esau being Edom. So it's two different nations mm -hmm. that that extended off. So, right, and Jacob is part of the promised lineage towards Jesus. And so when he says, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated, it wasn't individual people that, that God, sorry, it's talking about these nations, right? And so, um, and you might say, well, why does God hate a nation? Didn't he send Jesus to die for the whole world? 
Yes, but but the, the, what the point of saying, especially when it was talking about this Old Testament time where it was anybody outside of the people of God, it was the people of God who were sent to try to enlighten the rest of the world with their understanding, their knowledge, their love of God. And so that was kind of that, that kind of thought process there. And so the story of Jacob and Esau just really highlight this idea that that it's it's the promise is what we're talking about. It is absolutely the promise of God, um, not not just the lineage of who you're born, because Esau was born first. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the the reality is he should have been the one that was part of the promise. Just God chose Jacob, and to be a, it means Israel. Uh, so it just it's 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 very technical in what we're getting into and so i don't know if this is a good forum to do that but the reality is it's it god doesn't pick and choose a person that he hates this is just describing the the, the truth that israel were the, was the people of god mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so then you know paul comes to kind of say one of those other rhetorical questions that he has then what then shall we say is god unjust not at all and so he's saying, you know, God is righteous and his word has not failed. He's kind of going back to this, you know, God's word. Um, it's not as though God's word has failed in verse six. So he's kind of harkening back to that. Like God isn't unjust. God is righteous. Um, and then we see there, you know, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And, you know, I read there that mercy is kind of this big theme that kind of runs throughout the rest of Romans there. Um, and so we need to kind of think about that as we as we go continue on through this Bible study. Um, some of these these verses that have these, you know, threads that kind of weave through all of them. And I, w- I want to add to that, too, because you can read that section and be like, well, my life sucks. Things are not happening the way that I think they should. And so maybe that means God's not having mercy on me or God does not want to give me. He, uh, he doesn't want to have compassion on me. Right. He's, I have mercy on whom I have mercy. I have compassion on whom I have compassion. So if your life sucks right now, God's not favoring you. That's not what that means mm-hmm. at all. Right. So it's basically saying he's going to have mercy on his people. That's what we're getting back to again. This is a community thing. This is not just an individualistic thing. It, it, we are in community with each other. And if you are one of God's people, he will have mercy on you. He will have compassion on you. Again, that doesn't mean that everything in life turns out roses. But what it means is God is with you through that, right? And that you will be healed, whether it's in this life or in the life to come. And so God absolutely has mercy on you or has mercy for you to give out to you. Make sure that in the middle of the junk that you're going through, that you don't give up on God and say, well, God must have already given up on me. No, he's in that with you. And he's just and he's wanting to see you through that. Stick that out with him so that you can then experience his mercy in his timing. And I know that, that can be frustrating, but I promise you it's better than anything you can do on your own. Mm-hmm. So. Well, and then what, just what you said there, I mean, we got to remember back to this last chapter um, that we just went over. Uh, if God is for us, then who can be against us? And then Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble and hardship and persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And then he comes back and says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Like, And we've got, yes, exactly what you said. We've got to remember that this is a community thing that Paul is talking about right through here. So it's not where we get to say, you know, oh, well, God's not having mercy or compassion on me. If we're part of God's people, we're part of this more than conquerors. So. That's that's good. So um, then let's go on and uh, say, let's read um, verses 19 through 29 so here's one of kind of our bigger sections but (laughs) all right starting verse 19 one of you will say to me then why does god still blame us for who is able to resist his will but who are you a human being to talk back to god shall what is formed say to the one who formed it why did you make me like this does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use. 
What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there, will be call, there they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnants will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. My batteries are dead. Oh, crap. <laughs> I thought Adam checked the batteries before we started. He did all the prep work before we sat down, as was quoted to us. Okay, battery troubles, I'm back. <laughs> um, okay, so basically there in in that um, Paul is saying kind of right off the bat um, in verse 20, who do humans think they are to second guess God? Uh, and then he kind of goes on to say, do we get to tell him what to do? Do we get to tell the creator what to do with creation? Um, and so he just kind of offers up some 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 of these questions that are just kind of I don't know when when I read through this I kind of go whoa it's kind of a check for me yeah. um, sometimes when I'm you know when I think oh well is this would be great if God used this this way if he did you know which is I mean I think in sometimes in some instances it's just fine but in sometimes it can really be. I've got to check my attitude on that because yeah. I've had a couple conversations in the last, well, it's been a couple years with um, some people that they just, they really struggle with the idea of small, ordinary, daily obedience to God. And it's like they want this big, humongous thing to happen. And, and, and then, so they're pushing for that and then they get frustrated when it doesn't happen. And I just point to I point to this passage specifically. Let's see, verse verse twenty one. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay? So he the same lump of clay made you. The same lump of clay made me. My lump was a little bigger than yours, so that's that's fine. But it, the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes, and some for common use, like. Oh, that and that's hard. So I think I don't think it's as like it's it's a human thing, but here it's it's an American thing. We are entitled to be the 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 lump of clay. <laughs> like just that, just calling myself a lump of clay. Like that's humbling in and of itself. But like, so I'm a lump of clay, but I'm set aside for special purposes because I was born in the U.S. of A. I love that I was born in America. So grateful for that. But man, I cannot, just as we talked about before, I cannot forsake the advantages uh, that, that I was given with birth. And so being born in the United States of America does provide me advantages, but it does not provide me the, the desire, the, the reality of entitlement to be used for what I would deem a special purpose. All it entitles me is to be used by God. Praise God. Use me. But if it's for a common use, it's for a common use. I, I, I'll be a little vulnerable here. I have uh, like dreams of 
preaching in front of thousands of people, right? To be able to stand up and share the Word of God like a Billy Graham crusade or even even on a stage with, a, you know, a thousand seats out there. That would be amazing, right? Uh, like, but that's it would be amazing simply in my human nature, right? I, I, anytime I think about the Billy Graham story, I think about, you know, seven pastors back from him. And, and almost every pastor back from Billy Graham, the one that pastored him, small church. The one that pastored that pastor, small church. And so on and so on and so on. And there's these seven pastors that lead to Billy Graham, right? So if I'm going to be a lump of clay that's just common use, God, praise God. And let me live into that common use. And if God has a special purpose for me, he will make it known. Like I don't have to go, I don't have to go like forcing his hand, which I think a lot of Christians try to do. Man, let's let's just live in the presence of the moment every day and let God speak to us in that moment and lead us in that moment. Something extraordinary might happen. Maybe something that you never see on this side of eternity. But if we are obedient to God, even in, especially in our common use, mm-hmm. extraordinary things are going to happen because mm-hmm. it's God's plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Sorry, I don't know if that's where you're going. No, but I that's, just, like, <laughs> that's perfect. Yes. I think it's, we, and, it, sorry, I, just, I, I think that a lot of us get sad when we think that way. And so I want to make sure that, man, it's awesome to be commonly used lump of clay by God. Like, let's let's make that our goal. Just be used by God for common purposes all over. Imagine if everybody in Bloomfield and everybody in Sheraton would allow themselves to be just common lumps of clay for God. Mm-hmm. We would do amazing things. God would do amazing things through us. So mm-hmm. I won't interrupt anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, because if we're trying to live into a different purpose than what oh. God has for us, yep. like we have just kind of upset the apple cart so like if we're trying to be this but really we just we needed to be this so that we could you know maybe influence someone that was going to go on like i keep thinking about through this passage like you know um this lump of clay like i was so absolutely grateful that i get to be you know mom to four kids and the influence that i have in that just in the common everyday things of you know of teaching them of you know even washing their clothes and putting them away like the, some of those things you know that we just think are kind of mindless it's like let's do this to to influence them, you know, let's do like eat our meals together at the table to influence them and and to shape them. I mean, there's so many things in the common everyday thing that w- God will use for wonderful purposes as long as we just get past ourselves yeah. and go, I'm going to be okay with being used in this common purpose. A plate is never going to hold soup, mm-hmm. but it can hold a really good steak. You know, like I, I just think of like well, every time I think of clay, I think of pottery, right? Mm-hmm. The the band that I grew up listening to is Jars of Clay back mm-hmm. in the '90s, and I just love that thought. Um, but the reality is, there's sometimes you think that you want something better, right? And it's your definition of better, right? So like on a really hot or a really sorry, a really cold day, a bowl of soup is going to be phenomenal. And so uh, this plate wants to be this soup so I can be used and for this purpose. But man, when summer comes along, it's your time to shine now. You get to you get to provide steak. Like, I know that's a silly analogy, but I think it's apt. Like, mm-hmm. there are times that I want what other people have. And but if I can if I can set my vanity aside, if I can set my desires aside, there will come a day when God calls me to do exactly what he called me to do. And that's the that's the idea of the, of perfection. You know, the, the, whole, the idea of sanctification, the idea of, of holy perfection is to be used in exactly the purpose you were created to be used. Yeah. Woo! Like, and that's we're like, we created oh. to be Christ-like. Yep. And what did Christ do? He humbled himself yeah. mm-hmm. completely yep. and became a servant. And, you know, that's really, like, he didn't really go out there to make a name for himself. He went out there to, you know, to spread God's word. So, 
Ah, there we go. <laughs> that was a good discussion. That's <laughs> that really was, good. I ho- hope you guys drop some comments there if you if you've listened this far and you're still like, let us know like what what kind of thing, what kind of dreams and desires do you have that you think God might fulfill in you? And 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 again, you don't have to be set aside for um, a special purpose in your mind. Just be obedient daily, and I believe God will give you the desires of your heart. That's what His Word promises us. So, what dreams, what desires do you have that 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 you could fulfill if you were obedient to Christ every single day, even in common, especially in common use? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, I wanted to point out there too, in um, okay, so there in verse twenty-two. Um, he says, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath? And uh, Great House put this so just perfectly. Um, they couldn't find any other way to put it. But he's saying that Paul says there, God patiently withheld judgment against unrepentant sinners. Mm-hmm. Um, with great patience, bore with great patience the object of his wrath. He wants to bring people in. He wants them to have that that chance to come in to the family. And so that's how he's waited patiently. Do you know why Jesus hasn't come back yet? Because he wants more people to get saved. He wants more people to have a relationship with him. Well, God, Jesus himself says he doesn't know when he's coming back. God has not sent Jesus back because he wants more people to, to know him. Before he before he sends him, mm-hmm. guys, this it, time is now. Get right, get right with Jesus. And then um, there in twenty three, uh, what if he did this to make the rich of his, his glory known to the objects? I have objects of his mercy um, in my version, the NIV. Um, but Greenhouse said that we could. It's that pottery image. Um, so some translate it into vessels, um, the vessels of his mercy or the uh, the pottery. Like that's what kind of he's kind of hearkening back to, you know, that that lump of clay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that illustration to me sometimes I think it's lost in the translations. Um, but it's just it's just beautiful like imagery that he has going there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So. Um, and then there in 25, or in 25, so verses 25 and 26. So Paul's kind of going back, um, and he's bringing up these, these scriptures here, and he's, he's pointing this out as the anticipation of the inclusion of the Gentiles. So he's kind of bringing the scripture back to them and saying, like, this is where, you know, this is where we got off the map. We, we, we m- you know, mis- mistook this because this is what it says, that there's this inclusion of the Gentiles. And then there in verses 27 and through 29, um, he's talking, he's bringing these in to talk about God's exclusion of unbelieving Israel from his people. So it's that inclusion of the in Gentiles and the exclusion of those that don't come by faith. Mm-hmm. That's, and that's so true. And we carry it forward to today. Just because your parents raised you in church does not guarantee you a spot in the kingdom of God. And just because someone uh, grew up with a, a horrible lifestyle and made terrible choices and, and, and for the majority of their life was distant from God, they came to know Jesus Christ they are included, right? Like, so this is a beautiful imagery of, of what our life is can, is today still for those who, who need to follow Jesus Christ, who want to follow Jesus Christ, or who don't think they have to, to give everything, right? Who get wrapped up in this comfortable Christianity, which isn't Christianity at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's go ahead and finish out reading the rest of this chapter, and we'll discuss a little more um, about this last part of it. Uh, What then shall we say, verse 30, what then shall we say that the Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? 
But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So there again, you know, Paul's asking this rhetorical question, what mm. then shall we say? Um, and then he comes, brings this back to that faith versus works conversation that we've had, you know, earlier on in, in Romans. Um, and there, another quote from Great House there um, from the commentary, he said, Israel stumbled at Christ because to accept him meant accepting their need of his redemption. And then he said later on, they were tripped up by the crucified Messiah. Um, and so Paul's put it, that's exactly what Paul's saying there. Uh, they stumbled over the stumbling stones and then brings up this other, you know, scripture. Uh, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble. Mm-hmm. And, well, I was just going to say, like, that's, uh, you know, I think it's really important what, you know, how Paul brings this kind of all around. The Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained it. Um, righteousness that is by faith. Um, but then Paul goes, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal because they pursued it not by faith but as if it were by works. And that's been an issue, you know, it, through the church, and, uh, you know, we've seen for a long time. I mean, I think back through, you know, Martin Luther and um, his 95 thesis, like, you know, this this whole, we tend to take it one way, and then we've got to have something that kind of brings us back in that middle, and we've got to realize that it's it's by faith, and that's exactly what Paul is saying here. You know, I love the, I love the way he worded that about the Gentiles. Um, they they did not seek righteousness, but they attained it by faith. So what what that's telling us is that faith in Jesus Christ, a belief in Jesus Christ, does something inside of us that makes us right with God. That's the whole idea behind this works versus faith, uh, you know, salvation. It's not a works salvation. It's a faith salvation. And so when we have attained that righteousness because of faith, I'm, our actions start to line up with that, right? We Our eyes are open to what God really wants from us in different situations, and we attain the righteousness that he wants for us because we believed in his son. But when we start from the idea of, okay, I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and if I fail at that, then I fail at everything, and I might as well just quit. And that's when we get a lot of people leaving the church because they can't follow the rules. But if you will just follow Jesus, the rules will make sense, most times, not all the time, and you will find yourself truly wanting to follow them because they are life. Jesus is the Word of God, right? And so when we follow Jesus, we will follow the written Word of God as well, right? Not perfectly all the time, but our desire to do so will be there because it's happened inside of us. We didn't have any control over it. We just believed, and God did it inside of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's about all I have. I mean, can you... Do you think of anything like, you know, that closing thought kind of um, thing? And I know I'm kind of throwing you on the spot. <laughs> um, well. But can you think of anything as we've, you know, talked kind of through this? And we've kind of gone a little fast. But as I said, it kind of, Paul doesn't really, there's not a whole lot to explain here. Mm-hmm. Once you kind of get the background of what he's talking about and who he's talking to. Right. I think if you look back on 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 the part where he's talking about you 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 made a good point like so the Jews are asking this question has God changed the plans and so for us sometimes we start looking at the world around us and we say no that person doesn't belong 
right? That no, that that person's no, the off limits. He's done too much. I know too much about her. There's no way that can be the case. And I'm just, I want you to challenge yourself. I, I'm challenging you to make sure that your love includes everybody. Your love for the world includes the people that you might even hate. The people you don't like, the people you don't get along with, the people that just rub you the wrong way, the person that you just, because God loves them enough to let Jesus die for them. And that's that's huge, guys. We've got to love everybody, and I mean everybody. And I think that's the biggest the biggest takeaway. Now, maybe not the biggest takeaway from this whole passage, but a specific thing from this this one that I think that mm-hmm. is very practical for our lives because we all have people that we struggle with, mm-hmm. right? We all have people we struggle with, but God died for that person. Mm-hmm. Who are you to then tie in later? What you, who are you to say that person isn't worthy of the love of the church of the love of of the, of the body of Christ. God sent Jesus to die for them just like he did for you. Mm-hmm. So let's include everybody. Let's love everybody. Mm-hmm. And, and let, God, let God work through us in that way. Mm-hmm. Well, and I would challenge. Um, I know, you know, there's, there's not like a whole lot of people that have hit that list for me. Mm-hmm. Like s- that I wouldn't want them to be included in. Um but even people that I just even start to feel like, oh, I can't, I don't even want to talk to them. Like, I don't even want to see them. Don't let them see me. Don't let them see me. Yeah, don't let them just see me. like down into the, like, I'm going to pretend like if store. I get to that point where I see people and I recognize that in me, I just really, and I'll challenge you guys to do the same. I got to really start praying for them. And I really start praying that God opens up my eyes to what their life is. Mm-hmm. Um, like maybe they've done these things to me um, that make that cause me to go, please don't let them see me. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to have this awkward, you know. But really, you know, there's there might be a reason to that. I mean, like there's maybe something in their life that just... Like, they need that change. They need that change through Jesus, you know. And, like, until they come to that, uh, it, they're not going to have that change. And they're going to continue in, in that way. And I think if I can just show them, you know, Christ mm-hmm. in my actions, yep. then maybe they'll come to that. And so I would challenge, you know, you guys at home, if there's someone that you even try to avoid at the grocery store or anything like that, just, just really pray for God to open up your heart to them, to, you know, to, to love them. Like maybe, maybe you don't need to call them every day, but you need to get to that point where you at least don't avoid them in the grocery store. And it's, and it's impossible to, it's impossible to not have a heart change towards someone if you're praying for them. Right. God is going to work in your heart uh, towards that person. 100% guarantee it. So, yeah, that's good. That's a good word. Should we close in prayer? Yeah. Go right ahead. Lord, we just thank you for this day you've given to us. It's a beautiful day, and we are so grateful that we get to come in and to learn more about you. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to open up our hearts and our mind to this lesson that we've learned tonight. Lord, I pray that um, as this challenge goes, that you open up our hearts to the people that maybe we just, we don't have a good feeling towards it, that you'll just continue to open up our hearts to, to at least being able to talk to them, um, to have you know, some sort of a relationship with them other than just ignoring them. And Lord, I just, I just am thankful that you came for everybody. And Lord, I just pray that you just continue to teach us how to live that way in that knowledge that you've come for everybody, that you've died for everybody. And we just need to, to be Christ-like and to show your character to the world. Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you that you that you use these vessels um, for whatever purpose it is that you want to use them for. And I thank you, Lord, for even the common purposes that we are here for. And Lord, I just pray in our hearts that you'll just make us grateful for those things as well. Lord, I just thank you. And I just 
pray that you continue to work in our minds and our hearts this week with this lesson. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.